It's nice to be here at Small Talks 2009. When I was here two years ago at the first Small Talks, uh, mine was the only presentation in English. And so I think I'll continue to get more out of the conference myself uh, as I uh, keep coming. This morning I'm going to be describing an overview of gemstone. This is going to be an introduction to gemstone. It's also going to be an introduction to small talk. And uh, I'm James Foster. I'm on the persistence engineering team at gemstone. I've been programming since 1971, though only doing small talk for a little over 10 years. We're going to start with a brief discussion of small talk. I think that will help you see where gemstone fits in. Also, I'm hoping that if there's people that aren't as familiar with small talk, this will give you a little bit of an introduction. And also, if you have an opportunity to describe small talk to others, this will give you a little bit of uh, some of the things that I use to describe small talk. We will also then uh, do an overview of gemstone. There's a few particular areas of gemstone that people often have questions about. Namespaces, class versions, and some other things. So we'll, we'll be discussing that. So why learn small talk? One thing is that the words that you use often help you determine what you're going to be thinking. And Dijkstra put this, the tools that we are trying to use and the language or notation that we are using to express or record our thoughts are the major factors determining what we can think or express at all. So Dijkstra was arguing for expressiveness in our programming languages. And so learning New languages will help us uh, in this expressiveness. Small talk has been very influential. A uh, recent book of uh, 2009 says that small talk is a pure, object-oriented language, and although it never actually made it to the mainstream, it influenced language evolution in many ways. Small talk originated in the 70s. And for purposes of understanding how it might relate to commonly understood languages today, I think it's important to realize that operating systems were much closer to the languages uh, 30 years ago or 40 years ago. At that time, your operating system was, or the language was the operating system. And... Um, so the tie was much closer. Alan Kay, Dan Ingalls, and others at the Palo Alto Research Center developed small talk. Alan Kay coined the term object-oriented and modeled it on biology, where the goal was to have thousands of tiny computers that were interacting in well-defined ways. Small talk is what introduced Steve Jobs to the graphical user interface. Now, one of the areas of small talk that's confusing to people is that it's not a file-based development. And so characteristics of the file-based development, the schema and code is stored in text files external to the system. You have a separate compiler that generates a separate executable or an interpreter. 
and the per data is external to the system for persistence. There may be an integrated development environment that ties these pieces together. Rather than comparing Smalltalk to the file-based development environment, I find comparisons to other things that are maybe a bit more helpful to people. A database management system, so SQL, um, SQL Server from Microsoft or Oracle or other uh, systems, where the schema and code is internal, part of the data. There's tools available to manipulate it, but you're dealing with a live system where the changes you make are immediately implemented and you're making incremental changes to move from one system to another. Spreadsheets are, I think, an interesting comparison where you have a single tool where you have the code, the data, editors, and execution. If you save a spreadsheet, then the modifications you've made are preserved. You interact with it, get immediate feedback. You enter a formula into a spreadsheet and see what happened. Incremental changes take the system from one state to another, and you start out with a blank spreadsheet, but it still has certain base functionality built in. Another analogy is our own personal computers, where the computer, you make modifications from inside the environment, you have persistent state that is saved when you shut down and restart the computer. We now have virtual machines, Parallels, VMware, Zen, and others, where you have a complete self-contained environment. So with Smalltalk and the image-based development, the object represents the combination of behavior and properties, code and data. The object space, we sometimes think, say, the image, but I'd prefer to use the image as a description for the disk, the, where things are saved when it's not in use. The object space is where we interact with the objects in RAM. All-inclusive environment where you modify an existing system and the environment contains your tools. Everything is an object, simple, elegant language, powerful class libraries. For for purposes of introducing Gemstone, I'll identify some limitations of the traditional small talks. First, the object space must fit into RAM. So you're limited in the number of objects that you can reference by how much will fit in RAM. Next, the object space is visible to only one virtual machine. So you can only interact with one object space from one virtual machine. Sharing objects between virtual machines is challenging. You need to convert it to a non-object format. Binary file outs, XML, go out to a SQL database. So to share objects, you need to convert them into something other than objects. And even with the binary file out, if you file it in, if you file out two different routes that reference the same object and then file back in, you will have two copies. So we end up not preserving object identity when we go out through an external format. And that's a challenge, that's a problem. And if the VM exits without you saving an image, then you lose the object state. So these are some limitations of traditional small talk. And I'd like to invite you to enter the magical world of Gemstone to see where object space is limited by disk rather than RAM. As much as you can fit on disk, you can have an object space that big. Your object space is shared can be shared across multiple machine, virtual machines, and these multiple virtual machines can be running on multiple hosts, so you can distribute it. You have transactional persistence, 
so that when you commit a transaction, if everything crashes, you don't lose anything that you've saved through a transaction. So you don't have to go through the process of copying the entire memory space into a file. You can just, on a transaction by transaction, save things. So we'll go into some detail on these features. So what is Gemstone? A small talk environment? A database system? Well, it's two in one, both of those things. Gemstone is a multi-user object server. Gemstone is a programmable server object system that can manage large-scale repository of objects. Gemstone supports partitioning of an application between client and server. So you can run portions of the application on a client, portions on a server. Gemstone supports queries and indexes for large-scale object processing. So you can have millions of objects in a collection and in a millisecond find one object in a very short, short time. Supports transactions and concurrency control in the object repository. Again, pure, full database semantics. Supports connections to outside data systems. Login security and account management, some of the things that you would expect to get from a small talk, uh, excuse me, from a database system. Provides services to manage the object repository. And comprehensive statistics for charting and performance tuning. So enterprise system that uh, can, can support very significant uh, applications. Scalable, thousands of concurrent sessions. Hundreds of hosts can connect to the same object space. Terabytes of space, limited essentially by disk. Thousands of transactions per second. We have uh, one customer that regularly does 10,000 transactions per second on a very high-end, expensive hardware, but uh, you can do it if you need to. Concurrency. Concurrency is a challenge and uh, something that needs to be supported. Multiple user sessions can be active, and each user can have multiple sessions, connections to the database that are each independent. You can have separate or shared namespaces on a per-user basis. And we'll discuss that. Changes to objects are committed in a transaction. Full transaction semantics, either all or none of it, is visible. Concurrency controls, locking for coordination between multiple sessions. User-based security, so that it starts with a login. You need to be identified to the system with a user ID and password. There's namespaces, so what is visible to your session? What objects or globals are visible? Certain operations can be protected on um, a security basis. So only certain users have the rights to change passwords, administrative rights, to do a backup. Then, in the finest granularity, for security is per object read and write security. So you can identify on an object by object basis what permissions are available, who can read, who can write this object. You can set up groups to allow for security. So extensive security capabilities. The object server is programmable in Smalltalk. Data definition, that is Smalltalk classes. No, no schema definition as we have in some other systems. Object manipulation. You're sending messages to objects. This is how you, can, you interact with the object server. Query facilities. You execute small talk code to select, reject, detect objects. 
concurrency management. Small talk methods are available in the system to query who owns the lock, what other sessions are logged in, where is session, who, who is uh, logged in as session so and so. System management, doing backups and other things. Partitioning between the client and the server. There's a C API that is used to interact with Gemstone. API to log in, manipulate objects, send messages. There's a Java library that wraps the C library. So if you're writing in Java, you can communicate with Gemstone Smalltalk. But there's uh, most popular, most of Gemstone systems are using the C, excuse me, are wrapping the C library with Smalltalk. So in VisualWorks and Visual A, VA Smalltalk from instantiations, you have the capability of loading a Smalltalk library that then provides transparent replication and synchronization. So that as you make modifications to objects in your Smalltalk image in VisualWorks, or in VA Smalltalk, those changes are replicated to the database. And when changes are made in the database, those changes will be reflected in your uh, uh, local client library. Identity is preserved across multiple fetches. So if you happen to replicate the same object twice, it will have the same identity when it's loaded into your client Smalltalk environment. But in addition to these client systems, you can program directly in Gemstone using Gemstone Smalltalk. So you don't need to use a client Smalltalk to get to it. Now we've mentioned some limitations of traditional Smalltalk where you need to fit inside RAM, there's only one VM and the object state is not persistent. Well, with Gemstone, again, we're limited by the size of disk. You can have multiple sessions, and your view, the object space is shared amongst all the sessions, but your view is on a transactional basis and is isolated. So the point of your last commit or abort will give you your current view. And, like traditional small talks, reachability from a root object. So when you attach an object to a persistent object, generally by adding it to an existing collection, then commit your transactions. It will now be visible to other sessions. So on commit, new and changed objects are visible. When the next session, when other sessions commit or abort, they will be able to see your changes. Now, when you have millions or billions of objects in your system, querying becomes important. So Gemstone supports indexes for unordered collections, sets, identity sets, bags, things like this. You can create indexes. So, for example, create a quality index on, and then you can give a path to specify. This creates a B tree for uh, implementation, and the index maintenance is automatic. So adding or removing items from the collection, when you add an object to the collection, it will get indexed. If you modify an instance variable on an object that's in an indexed collection, and if that instance variable participates in the index, then the index will be updated. So uh, you don't have to programmatically update indexes. Simply modifying an object and the index will be updated. Of course, indexes need querying capabilities. In Gemstone, there's a special syntax in addition to some message sending protocols um, so for example, I can say of a large set, select from each where the, each surname is Foster and each given name is James. 
And this will give me, very quickly, just the items in the larger collection that have small, that meet this criteria. Now we're using a little bit of a different syntax here for those of you who are um, looking at the small talk. There is the curly braces is a syntax for this is to be used in queries over indexed collections in Gemstone. And also the dot notation is a reference to um, instance variables. So this is a special way of querying in Gemstone. You can also get a stream. So if you're not sure how many objects will meet the criteria, but you want to just start by looking at the first one, you can say select as stream from each, where each surname is greater than or equal to Foster. And that will get you immediately to the first one, and then each time you say next, it will give you another object from the collection using the index that you've specified. So we'll query things and get the results in a particular order. This particular um, protocol gives you very nice uh, what we call VCR widgets, where you can click to start at the beginning, uh, next, next will give you another page. So when you're doing something like Google searches, you can say, look at the first page, the second page, the third page. And this, this is very, very fast queries. Because again, it's using B trees, so it can go straight to the, the correct point in the, in the list. Now in Gemstone, we have transactional semantics. Your view is isolated with repeatable reads. So changes may, that you make before you commit are not visible outside your session. They're visible to you, but not to others. Changes that have been made in other sessions since you started are not visible to you. So once you have a particular view, your view stays consistent. You have a snapshot of the database at the moment when you last did an abort or commit. So other people can modify things. Your queries give you back the state of the world that existed at the time that you got your snapshot of the database. If you do an abort, all your changes are lost, no longer visible to you or to anyone else, and you get a new view of the database as from its most recent state. Now, concurrency. There's challenges with concurrency. Any multi-user, multi-VM uh, system will have these challenges. And there's two broad approaches, optimistic concurrency and pessimistic. With optimistic concurrency, you wait until a commit is attempted and look for conflicts. When a commit is requested, the system checks to see if any objects modified in the current session have been modified by another session after you started. So if someone has modified an object and then you try to commit a change to the object, if there is any right-right conflicts, then your commit will fail. And your view will remain as it was before the commit, and you need to abort, get a fresh view, and then it's application dependent on do you retry or do you ask the user. Tell the user you can't save those changes, someone else did, so you need to look at things and re decide what to do. Pessimistic concurrency. At any time, any session may request a write lock on any object. Once you've obtained the right lock, then no other session can modify that object, can commit a change to the object that you have locked. Now, to make sure you have a fresh view, you would generally want to commit or abort after you obtain the lock to make sure that your view is the most recent of that object. And now you can proceed to make changes confident that 
your changes will not produce a conflict since no one else can make changes after you obtain the lock. There's APIs in the system to find out who owns the lock. So if you want to lock something and fail, you can find out who has it. Now there are times when it's acceptable to have multiple changes to the same object. For example, if you have a set or a bag, if multiple P sessions are adding separate objects to a collection, to a set, where order, by definition for a set, order is not important, then having multiple sessions add should be acceptable. Gemstone has what's called reduced conflict that are safe in, if you use them in well-defined ways. An RC identity bag. Multiple sessions can add objects to an RC identity bag. If they add the same object, then it will be added twice. The nature of bags can hold multiple references to the same object. A key value dictionary. Two different sessions can add keys, modify the value of different keys, of the dictionary at different keys. You would get a conflict if two sessions attempted to modify the same key, but as long as they're on separate keys, then it should be acceptable to have parallel modifications. We have something called an RCQ, where multiple sessions can add objects to the queue, and then one session can take items out of the queue, and they'll come off in order. RC counter, multiple sessions can increase or decrease a counter. And while the current value might not reflect all the changes, um, in the end, once everybody's committed, logged out, the counter will have the correct value in it, or the updated value that's consistent from all the modifications that have been made. Gemstone provides the capability of interfacing to external systems. You can write a user action in C as a library and load it into Gemstone. When you invoke a function on the user action from Smalltalk, you can pass it objects and then it can interact. There's an add-on product in Gemstone called GemConnect that provides both a Smalltalk library and a C library that interfaces to an Oracle database, giving you those capabilities. In version 3 of the 64-bit product, which should come out next year, we have a Smalltalk, pure Smalltalk API to C libraries, which will make that even easier. User authentication, what sort of security does Gemstone provide? Well, you need a valid ID and password recognized by the database to connect. There's rules on when the password needs to be modified, how many characters it needs to have, how many can be repeating, how many can be consecutive, limits on concurrent logins, you can also configure the system to require a host user ID and password in addition to the database. But the default is to just run all the VMs under one um, gemstone session, user ID. After authentication comes authorization. What is a particular user allowed to do once they're connected? Well, you need to have certain privileges to even change your own password. You might not give a user that privilege if it's a semi-public account or something, for example, in a classroom setting. You need to have privilege to change someone else's password. You need to have privilege to compile Smalltalk code. So you might build an application where the developers have permission to change the code, compile code, and users log in and can run the code but not modify it. Performing backups, certain user or system administrative, database administration function, garbage collection. 
Accessing the file system is a privileged operation that can be allowed or denied to, on a user-by-user -user basis. Loading, calling a user action, and executing a shell command on the server, something that very handy to be able to do, but you might not want uh, certain users doing it. So those are examples, there's others, but those are examples of authorizations that uh, a recognized user can be allowed or denied. And then the deepest level of security is object access security. So each user can be associated with one or more groups. So you can define groups and put assign users to the groups. Each object can be associated with a security policy. And we have 15 bits reserved for security policy. Security policy identifies an owner for an object. Groups that are permitted for that object. And then permissions for the owner. Does the owner have read and or write permission to the objects in this policy? Do groups have read and or write permission to objects with this policy? And does the world have read and or write access to objects with this policy? So very high degree of granularity on security. And we have customers in the financial industry who take this sort of thing very seriously. System management, you can do an online backup. Um, so you do not have to take the system down. Generally, Gemstone systems um, run 24 hours, seven days a week. We have some customers that uh, schedule downtime once a year for uh, only a short period of time. And any Gemstone up server upgrades for the actual Gemstone underlying product need to be done in that time. But uh, other than that, the system is very reliable, just stays up, but you can make backups while it's up. Restore tran logs. Use shared memory. Again, system management, configuration. Asynchronous I.O. can be used to parallelize writing to disk. So if you have multiple disks, you can be keeping all the disks busy, which improves performance. Hosts can be added or removed. So if you want to run VMs on more hosts than you currently have, you can add them. And no special configuration is needed. Uh, you can just add them to a running system. Monitoring, tuning for performance. Now, namespaces. One of the interesting discussions in the Smalltalk community is namespaces. And uh, how do you identify names when you're compiling? Well, there's a number of rules for that. And in traditional Smalltalk and Gemstone, block arguments and temps, method arguments and temps, object instance variables, class instance variables, class variables, pool dictionaries, and then finally, globals. So the question is, where are globals found? Well, in traditional small talks, there's one system dictionary in which the keys are global names. And when you compile, it uses that one pre-built, system-recognized uh, global dictionary. And often it exists in itself as small talk. So you can say small talk is a dictionary where the keys are globals and the values are all the objects. And this in traditional small talks happens to be the root for the object graph. In Gemstone, where are globals? When you compile a method, where does it look for the names? Well, in addition to the first six, once we get to globals, Instead of having one dictionary, you can have an ordered list, an array of dictionaries. And rather than that being hard-coded in the VM, you can pass that list to the compiler. 
So for each method, you can identify a list of dictionaries that will be searched in order to find globals. Each session has a default, and the default is assigned when the user logs in. So each user has a default list of globals that are visible to that user. There's extra flexibility because different methods can be compiled to reference different globals. But users can share these dictionaries. So one particular dictionary can be shared amongst multiple users. And so you can ignore the complexity by just accepting the default arrangement. In Gemstone, the root of the object graph is a user profile set. So the users, the collection of users forms the root of the object graph. Users are the basis for Gemstone. Each user has a user profile, an instance of the class user profile, that identifies the user ID, the symbol list, which groups that user is part of, what their password is, when they last updated their password, and so on. There's access to the user profile for the current user, my user profile, or for someone else's profile. If you have security, you can say all users, user with ID, data curator will give you the user profile for data curator. Each user has a symbol list, which is a subclass of array, and the symbol list is made up of a collection of symbol dictionaries. And those symbol dictionaries have keys and values. The keys are symbols, global names, and the values are any object. Typically, they are classes. So again, how do you reference classes? Well, they need to be referenced through a symbol dictionary, which needs to be part of a symbol list, which needs to be in a user profile, which needs to be in the user profile set. Classes, singletons, and collections are all part of the symbol dictionary. What sort of namespace usage do we get from that? Well, you can deploy multiple applications in one database without conflicts. So if you have a gemstone system installed, want to deploy multiple applications, all you need to do is isolate them, and there'll be no name conflicts. You can compile application classes separately from your development and test classes. In traditional small talk and development, when you compile your tests, unless there's some namespace protection scheme, you run the risk of referencing development and or test classes from your application. But with this namespace approach, you can isolate your application from development and testing. You can compile third-party libraries based solely on the base class, on gemstone built-in classes, so that third-party libraries don't interfere with each other and can be referenced by your application, but they don't have to see your application. No, no conflicts with the application or other third parties. Now, one of the things that uh, we find uh, in Gemstone is changing class schema. How do you modify the class schema? Well, in traditional small talks, you save the new class definition, and when you do, it replaces the class as a value in the global dictionary. Five minutes. When you do that, it finds all instances of the old class in the object space. It creates new instances based on the new class definition for each old instance, copies values across, does a become to swap the old objects and the new objects and preserve the references, and then does a garbage collect of the old instances and class definition. So this is what happens in traditional small talk when you save a new class definition. 
that's not quite so easily done in gemstone small talk. First, we have a large object space. And doing all instances is expensive, maybe prohibitively expensive. It might take many minutes or even hours to find all instances of a class. But even more important, the concurrency management prohibits us from changing objects that are in someone else's view. So we don't allow you to change someone else of an object that someone else is looking at. So that makes it difficult to follow the traditional approach. But recall that even in the traditional approach, you don't change a class definition. You don't change the schema for an object. It's simply a new one that replaces the old one, and new instances are created, and the illusion of change happens because it takes place quickly. So it looks like you're changing things when you're actually replacing them one at a time. So in Gemstone, the schema changes are gradual. You can create a new class, and it can coexist with other classes, with other definitions for a class. Objects are instances of some version of the class, but maybe not the current, the most recent version. Saving a class simply defines a class, and the definition can specify a previous version. You can even have different, a new name for a class, but be a version of an old class. Two definitions share a class history, and then there's protocol for migrating individually, objects individually, or migrating them as a group. And you can create your own methods that help in the migration. So if you were changing um, degrees to radians, you could go through a formula and make the modifications. Now, gemstone, um, you've heard of LAMP, perhaps, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Perl, Python, PHP. Well, we have GLASS, Gemstone, Linux, Apache, Seaside, Smalltalk. Um, the acronym also works for those who are doing Gemstone, Linux, AIDA, Scribo, and Smalltalk. So we don't want to leave out the uh, AIDA people. There is multiple web frameworks in Smalltalk. But you may notice uh, at the bottom of the Smalltalks 2009 website, there's a little note that says powered by glass. So Gemstone is being used for the Smalltalks website. If you'd like to get started, there's a free, no-cost license that's use can be four gigabytes of data and one machine. Um, otherwise fully functioning, the production system. It's available as a virtual appliance, fully configured for Linux. So you can download this VMware appliance and use it on the Mac under VMware Fusion or under Windows with VMware Server or other systems. Or you can do a native install on the Mac or Linux. And there's even a Cocoa application that I have that uh, brings up Gemstone, starts a database. And uh, now I've got Gemstone running on my Mac as a Cocoa application here, can access it. I invite you to an architectural tutorial this afternoon, starting at uh, 1430. Uh, we'll be going into a fair amount of technical detail. This won't be small talk programming or gemstone programming, and uh, it'll be a technical presentation of the implementation. Processes, garbage collection, it's a three-hour summary of a three-day tutorial that uh, we have. So if you're interested in deeper technical details, 
uh, plan on coming to that. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them now or later. And otherwise, we'll let the next uh, session uh, start getting ready. Is there life outside of gemstone? What's missing from it? <laughs> well, yes. Well, one thing is gemstone is a server small talk. And it has a particular niche, not a small niche, but a niche where it makes sense to use it. Um, it's a server, application server, where you run small talk. Gemstone does not have a native graphical user interface. And so if you're writing a client-rich application that is to have widgets that are presented on the screen on a Windows, um, on a Windows machine, then you'll need a client small talk uh, to do that. Gemstone can handle the data, the application server, but doesn't present a user interface. For that, you will need a client small talk. But uh, if you're going to a web server, then you can generate web pages straight inside small talk, inside Gemstone small talk. Um, beyond that, the class library, you'll find different dialects of small talks have different class libraries that are either vendor provided or add-ons, so if you go to the Syncom store repository, you'll see a great number of add-on libraries for Syncom Smalltalk that you can load using store into Syncom Smalltalk. If you go to Squeak Source, you'll find a number of Squeak libraries, that, uh, libraries that can be loaded into Squeak, possibly Feral. Um, probably Faro also. Um, Gemstone supports Monticello as an external file format for code sharing. And so you can try loading from Squeak Source into Gemstone, but uh, you will uh, find the class libraries may have differences and there'll be some porting work. Does that answer the question some? Well, there's always things missing. I mean, I think uh, Stefan this morning gave a wish list. On the other hand, actually, I think some of those things, uh, security, partitioning, namespaces, um, multi-machine, multi-VM, multi-core CPU, um, a lot of that is there with Gemstone. But uh, there's always performance, scaling, um, more class libraries to be added. Um, there's always more, but uh, this is this is a lot. I guess maybe what's missing is a question for our customers and users. Um, but uh, Seaside is something that uh, is available and in use. Um, we're working on a port of we're we're participating in the Seaside 3.0. Um, we have alpha versions and beta will be out soon. Uh, Monticello. Um, Metacello is uh, on top of Monticello and a source code management system. People are using it, finding it useful. Questions? Some connection. Oh, reporting tools. Well, of course, reporting tools are um, yes, okay. This, this is a weakness in, um, I won't say in Gemstone, I will say in 
and not even small talk, just in object systems where you have dynamic typing. Um, because we have dynamic typing, which we know and love, um, we can't do static-based queries. Um, so there are limitations in that. On the other hand, if you're willing, just because you have a dynamic system doesn't mean you have to be dynamic. If you're willing to constrain your collections to particular objects, and if those objects are constrained to have instance variables of particular types, then you can. Um, you can do queries. And actually, I have a prototype and have done a demonstration, a proof of concept, of using ODBC and uh, the ODBC type tools to access a gemstone repository and do queries against gemstone with ODBC. So, um, again, the, the next presenters should come and start setting up. Right? Okay, and again, quite, quite willing to discuss more later. Thank you.